Um, <coughs> if any of it is too simplistic, please do let me know, and I'll maybe progress a bit more quickly through those aspects. So as I've mentioned, what I have planned today is to begin with just a brief theoretical overview, followed by uh, what I've termed building the case for heritability and focusing on kind of genetic variation and transmission of complex disorders with a particular focus on post-traumatic stress disorder, which is the area in which I primarily work. And I'd just then like to end the session with um, speaking a bit about psychiatric genetics in the context of South Africa and Africa. Okay, so to begin, as I promised, a brief theoretical overview. So we know that you know, almost 40 trillion cells in the body, and each cell contains a complete copy of the organism's genetic code in the nucleus. The genome is what we term the complete copy of the genetic information, which is contained within this, this, this nucleus. The chromosome, uh, the literal definition of that is the colored body, which comprises chromatin, which is essentially DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid, complexed with protein and RNA. Oh, of course. <laughs> of course, of course. Is the volume okay? So volume okay, pace, slow it down a bit. Okay, of course. So just to recap, genetic information in the nucleus, chromosome is a complex of chromatin, which itself comprises DNA with proteins or RNA with proteins. And there's just a little, the X shape is what we term the chromosome. If we look at uh, kind of looking more specifically at the structure of DNA, we know that it's a highly complex, folded, complicated, convoluted structure. It's compacted within 23 chromosome pairs in humans, and genes are just essentially defined as regions of DNA. Um, from kind of a regulatory functional perspective, we now know that less than 2% of all DNA codes for proteins. So you may kind of hark back to, the, to what we call the, the central dogma. So DNA being replicated, being transcribed to RNA, being translated to proteins. So for many years, for decades, it was thought that most DNA was involved in that process from DNA through RNA to proteins. Now we're actually starting to consider that perhaps most of the DNA is non-protein coding, non-protein coding, and most of it may in fact perform a more regulatory function. Looking again, I think it's always helpful to kind of conceptualize things in a, in a, in a graphic form. So if we zone in on the building blocks of the DNA, these are essentially what we call nucleotides. So if we think of DNA as a, a kind of a ladder which has been kind of con convoluted and twisted in on itself, the sides of the ladder comprise the sugar, which is the deoxyribose, attached to the phosphate, and the rungs of the ladder comprise what we call the nitrogenous bases. And the bases are paired together in a very specific order. So we have, let me see if I follow, here we go. So we've got the rungs of the, sorry, the size of the ladder, and then the rungs of the ladder, comprising two of the four ni ni nitrogenous bases, which are cytosine, guanine, thymine, and adenine. And essentially, adenine always binds to thymine, and cytosine always binds to guanine. If we look going from a very micro level to a far more macro level, oopsies, sorry about that, macro level, there are in fact 3.5 billion base pairs in the human genome. So pairs of these kind of nitrogenous bases which form the rungs of the ladder. And there are approximately 20.5 thousand genes in the human genome. So these are functional sections of the DNA double helix. So this is something I thought just kind of a nice soft entry into genetic variation, something that I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, um, the genes of eye color. So when I speak about the word allele, I'm speaking about one of two or more forms of the DNA sequence of a gene. So you've got the allele for blue eyes, which we know is recessive, and the allele for brown eyes, which we know is dominant. The next kind of slightly technical term I wanted to introduce you all to is kind of homozygous versus heterozygous, the noun homozygote versus heterozygote. So a homozygote is an individual with the same allele, so, so the same copy on both members of the chromosome pair, whereas a heterozygote is an individual with two different alleles. So if we look going across the slide, well, let me see if I can, my, there we go. Going across the, the slide from individual A through to individual C, we see that individual A, who is heterozygous, so one kind of blue eye allele and one brown eye allele, will end up having brown eyes because of the dominance of the brown eye allele. 
individual B, who is homozygous for the brown eye allele, will also have brown eyes. And individual C, who is homozygous for the blue eye allele, will end up having blue eyes because, of the, because they are too recessive, autosomal recessive. So the, the next kind of brief introductory aspect I wanted to talk to you all about was the types of genetic diseases. Now these can essentially be classified in one of four ways. The first is the chromosome disorders, again, which most people not involved in kind of medicine or genomics are already familiar with. So these are disorders in which entire chromosomes or large segments of chromosomes are altered in some way, missing, duplicated. So here you have something like Down syndrome. The second type is your single gene, or what we term the Mendelian disorders. Here, you've got a single gene altered, so not an entire chromosome, just a single gene. Examples here are cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, and hemophilia. The less rare and kind of third category is your mitochondrial disorders. These are essentially ca caused by small cytoplasmic mitochondrial DNA alterations. And finally, and this is kind of where the, where the crux of, of, of today's session is going to be focused, you have your multifactorial complex disorders. Now, as the name would suggest, these disorders result from a very complex kind of multidimensional interplay between a range of genetic and environmental factors. And as you would have guessed, this is where your psychiatric disorders come into play. <clears throat> so, complex disorders or your, or your multifactorial disorders are essentially most of the common disorders which we find to run in families. As I've mentioned, uh, kind of the, the, the net cause of a number of, of interactive risk factors. <clears throat> because the etiology is so complex, what we find is that such disorders don't actually have a clear cut pattern of inheritance. And because of this, the implications are twofold. In the first instance, it's difficult to predict the risk of either inheriting or passing down these diseases. And secondly, it's also often difficult to treat. So I've listed a few kind of biological, and, and, uh, biological disorders there, things like asthma, diabetes, hypertension, and then as I've mentioned, certain psychiatric disorders. I thought this was quite a, quite a nice infographic that I must give um, acknowledgement to Sharifa for providing to me. So this is just kind of a little pie chart representing the, the, the etiology of the Mendelian versus the complex disorders. So on the left, um, in, in kind of pie chart A, you can see that if each slice of the pie represents a group of etiological risk factors, you can see that there are few, few, far fewer slices in the Mendelian pie. So I think that this was referring to something like lung cancer. So you've got genetic predisposition, some other genetic predispositions, and cigarette smoking. Whereas if you compare that to the pie for the complex disorders, you can see that there are far more slices. So a whole lot of different, ooh, there we go, a whole lot of different genetic variants or genetic kind of risks, and then also a whole lot of different environmental stimuli or environmental risk factors. And I've always find that a, found that a really helpful way to conceptualize complex or psychiatric disorders. Okay, so the kind of the, the today's session is split between psychiatry and, and genetics, and that's kind of where, where my love and, and, and where my focus is. So the question that, that many ask, and some of you may be asking, so why a focus or why a study of psychiatry in South Africa? Well, recently, about 10 years ago, a very large, what we term nationally representative study called the South African Stress and Health Study, or the SASH, was conducted including approximately 4,000 individuals um, canvassed in households across South Africa. And what they found from the SASH was that almost a third of adults included in this particular cohort were found to experience a mental disorder in their lifetimes, which is fairly, fairly prevalent. And that within the kind of the, um, the categories of mental disorders, anxiety disorders were in fact found to be the most prevalent. So we can see from an epidemiological perspective, the burden of psychiatric disorders in South Africa is fairly rife. If we look now at the kind of the, the cost, both the direct and indirect cost of this kind of health burden in South Africa, I quite like this graphic because it, it mentions that, you know, while you do have direct costs, kind of uh, mental health costs, infrastructural costs of, of uh, psychiatric disorders, you also have really important indirect costs, um, interpersonal issues, uh, caregiver burden, uh, dependent child burden, uh, occupational functioning. I think all of these are really important aspects of mental health care and psychiatric disorders that really shouldn't be shouldn't be un underestimated. <clears throat> 
And if we look here at, at, at some, of the, some of the figures, if we look at the total cost in loss, of, uh, in loss of earnings for South Africans with mental disorder, we're looking at about almost 30 billion rand. And when we compare this to the governmental spending on mental health services, it's only about 500 million rand, which obviously in and of itself is a lot of money, but when compared to the billions of rand that results from occupational dysfunction, you can see that there's a real discrepancy. And I think a lot of this um, kind of motivates, m motivates researchers and clinicians working in, in, in psychiatry in South Africa. So kind of the second tier of today's talk and of my expertise is why psychiatric genetics. So really one of the, um, one of the kind of key rationales for, for, for being involved in this area of research and study is that it's been found that psychiatric disorders actually have a fairly high heritability. Now the term heritability is often used colloquially, but if we look at it in more scientific terms, this refers to the proportion of observed variants in a group of individuals that can be explained by genetic variants. So kind of in much simpler terms, like what proportion does G do, do genes really, really come into play? <clears throat> so what I've included here is just a, a brief comparison, so I'm not sure if, if the text is very clear for you, but a brief comparison of the heritability of biomedical disorders on the left versus psychiatric conditions on the right. And in increasing uh, heritability, which is represented as a percentage, so the proportion of genetic variants, you can see that um, psychiatric disorders actually f lie at a fairly significant end of the spectrum. So going from about 30% for anxiety, depression, eating disorders, all the way up to about 80% for things like schizophrenia and, and, and ADHD. And I think this is important because height, which is one of the most highly heritable non-psychiatric traits, also falls at about 80%. Okay, so the, the, the next kind of portion of today's session, I wanted to focus on building a case for heritability or building a case for genes. So this is kind of a very silly, simplistic uh, diagram that I, that I generated a few years ago. But for me, it was very helpful to really um, kind of visualize how psychiatric genetics and really genomics in general have progressed over the past say 30 years or so. So in, in the, the early days of genomic studies, we began, or in, of heritability studies rather, we began with uh, family-based or twin slash adoption studies. And I'm gonna go, go through each of these tiers of, of the triangle in detail. Thereafter, uh, the field moved to a focus on single or candidate gene or SNP. This kind of acronym is pronounced SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism studies. Thereafter, shortly after the completion of the Human Genome Project, the field really got a kickstart into genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. Very recently, maybe in the last five or 10 years, we've moved to next generation sequencing. And really, the kind of very top red pinnacle of this triangle is where I think the field is going to be moving <clears throat> in future. So this is really moving into consortium or team science. Okay, so now going kind of sequentially through each layer of that, of that pyramid. So <coughs> family studies and twin studies, now these really formed the benchmark of early heritability studies. So in family studies, you basically tracked a number of generations of a particular family and looked at the prevalence of a particular disorder manifesting. Um, so, you, so you're basically able to track the kind of risk pattern of this particular disorder. So family studies were great for um, identifying kind of um, relatives who were at, in, at, at increased risk of developing a particular disorder. But the main um, disadvantage of family studies is that they were unable to tease apart whether this increased risk was due to genetic risk or due to environmental risk. So then twin studies came along and addressed this major limitation. So in twin studies, which is essentially the concept of twin studies is that you either compare heritability between monozygotic, which are identical twins, versus dizygotic, which are non-identical twins, or you take monozygotic twins who have been adopted, so have been separated, so adopted separately, and compare heritability. So in your monozygotic twins, you've got almost 100% of shared genome. So if they are um, kind of raised in different environments and there's a difference in heritability, then you know that that difference is essentially caused or most, most likely caused by um, environmental factors. Okay, so um, you know, because of, 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 its, of its methodology, twin study studies were able to differentiate between genetic and environmental risk. 
but the major limitation of twin studies is they couldn't really tease apart specific genetic variants or specific genes that conferred increased risk to the disorders of interest. And that's where the molecular genetic era was born. So this is basically, the molecular gene studies are basically the way in which we measure genes, if, if I were to term it that way. And um, the way in which we, we measure genes is by determining variation between individual genomes. So again, there are kind of just three main um, methodological types of, of, of molecular gene studies, which I'll go through in, in sequence again. So you've got your, uh, your small changes, and these are your SNPs that I'd mentioned earlier, your single nucleotide polymorphisms. Then kind of structural variation studies. Uh, these were popular for a time, but have recently been, been replaced by um, category C. So C and V stands for copy number variation. And then your microarray GWAS, genome-wide association studies which have recently been, been kind of um, fallen out of favor a bit in favor of your next generation sequencing. Okay, so many small changes. So this is where your SNPs, your single nucleotide polymorphisms come in. So a SNP essentially refers to one letter variation in DNA. So if you look at individuals purple, blue, and orange, you can see that their genome is the same apart from this one polymorphism. So purple has A, Blue has G and orange has T. And that really is as simple as a SNP is. And because it's so simple and because the genome is so complex, they are about to, they've been found to have about 10 million SNPs in the human genome. Now, what we've come to discover, however, is that disorders don't result from one big bang. So, they, so most single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs have a relatively low predictive value for developing a disease. Disease, however, usually occurs from many small hits. So in the same unlucky person, you have enough common SNPs occurring. So that's essentially how this kind of SNP paradigm works. <clears throat> the next category I'd mentioned in the molecular gene studies was the structural variation. Whoops. There we go. So from a macro level, I'd mentioned the kind of larger whole chromosome disorders, the, the, for example, Down syndrome. On a micro level, you have things called copy number variations in which small insertions or duplications within the DNA molecule happen. And then on the kind of below micro, le micro level, you've got your SNPs, which are your single letter changes, as I, as I mentioned. <clears throat> so the Human Genome Project, are, is anyone, most people aware of the Human Genome Project? Okay, okay, I see a, I see a kind of a a wave of, of nods. So, um, so for, for those of you who are not familiar with this project, it was a, an extremely ambitious project initiated in 1990 and completed 13 years later. And its aim was to sequence all three billion nucleotides. So remember the nucleotide was that building block of the DNA with the base and the phosphate and the sugar in the human genome. Uh, its cost was not cheap, about three billion US dollars, which today is very expensive, obviously in 1990, which is um, astronomical. So while there have been subsequent quite significant discussions about the cost versus benefit of undertaking such a hugely ambitious and hugely expensive project, um, the benefits of the Human Genome Project is that it really ushered in a new era of genomic, of genomic medicine and really paved the way for all the kind of amazing cutting edge advances in DNA technology that are now developing. Okay. So I'd mentioned this, the GWAS, the Genome-Wide Association Study. <coughs> so this method of molecular gene study really took off after the completion of the Human Genome Study. And from a, from a methodological perspective, there are two main ways of undertaking kind of a gene-based study. You've got your candidate gene, or your SNP approach, and then you've got your microarray, or genome-wide association approach. So what your candidate gene uh, or, or SNP approach does is that you essentially just look at one gene or one candidate or one genetic variant. So your scope is, is fairly limited. The advantages of your candidate gene approach is that it's much cheaper and much easier to, to, to conduct this kind of study. The main criticism of your candidate gene approach is that it could be seen as a cherry picking um, excursion in that uh, you have no opportunity for new gene discovery because you've kind of a priori identified your gene or your variant of interest and uh, you may have insufficient covery of high risk, low kind of common genes. Uh, your, your kind of second GWAS based approach is your microarray. So a microarray, and I have a little graphic later on, your microarray is essentially a, 
a chip in which, in which uh, you have drops of DNA are placed onto a chip and then you have a candidate or SNP investigation which spans the entire genome. So not entirely comprehensive, but far more comprehensive than your candidate or, or SNP approach. Uh, the issue with the, with the microarray approach is that it's much more expensive, much more labor intensive, and can, I suppose, be conceptualized as a fishing expedition because you don't really identify your key genes, of, your key variants of interest before conducting the particular analysis. Okay, so basically your SNP or your, or your, or your microarray approach has really been kind of gold standard for the past 15 years or so until about five years ago. Okay, so this is basically just what I was talking about, about your little chip on which you place your blood. So um, the, the, the kind of technique of it is, is a little bit more complex than it needs to be, but the theory of it is actually very simple. So you have individual one in the orange column who has the disease, individual, two, individual B or two in the blue column who doesn't have the disease. And you've got your polymorphism of variant one, two, and three. And essentially what's happening is you're comparing these three polymorphisms or variants across your two individuals. So you can see, and, the, and it's, it's represented in, in green here, so you can see variant one doesn't really have a significant difference between individuals one and two. Um, the number of green dots is about the same. Same goes for individual, uh, for uh, variant two. The number of yellow dots is about the same. However, if we look at, in, at, at variant three, SNP three, you can see that there are far more red dots in individual orange versus individual blue. So in kind of a GWAS study, you would then deduce that um, SNP three or variant three is a significant predictor for this particular disease. Just to give you an, an idea of how kind of GWAS is evolving and the progress that has been made to date, uh, you can see that depression and schizophrenia are leading the pack. So this is a genome-wide association catalog with almost 100 studies. It's probably more now. This, this slide was, this was from kind of mid last year, followed by bipolar, pretty, pretty, pretty strong follower, and then ADHD and autism kind of bringing up the rear. Um, PTSD, actually, and I'm going to talk to you about, about a PTSD GWAS, which, which was conducted um, mid last year, the, the last largest genome-wide association study of PTSD has just come out. So anyone who searches this GWAS catalog should find that particular PTSD study. OK. <coughs> so nearing the top of our, of our pyramid now, we've got our next generation sequencing. So this is also called high throughput sequencing. And this differs from our microarray or chip approach in that the entire genome is sequenced. So there's no selection, there's no a, a priori kind of uh, gene, gene or variant identification. You basically go in and you sequence the entire genome. Uh, the advantage is obviously it's the most comprehensive type of, 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 of genetic analysis you can do. You can, there's gene discovery possible, rare mutations you, you can discover. The major and I think almost prohibitive disadvantage is how expensive next generation sequencing is. So as an example, in some of the studies that we do in the Department of Psychiatry, we only have enough funding to example do sequencing on about 300 people. Um, whereas you really should do for these kind of studies in, in, in the target of, of thousands of people. What is fairly promising, though, is that as more and more people, as more and more research groups want to undertake next generation sequencing, we're hoping that the cost from the tech companies, from Illumina and such, will actually start decreasing. So watch the space. Potentially, we're, we're moving into the age of, of, of next generation sequencing. OK, and then the kind of very, very pinnacle of the triangle was our team science, or our consortium approach. Now, essentially, what, what this encapsulates is combining individual study findings from separate study sites or separate study groups. So you basically do a meta-analysis or a pooling of data and a combined analysis of these individual genomic studies. Um, two main uh, consortia, which are kind of really leading things in psychiatric genomics, are the PGC, or the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. So this was started about less than 20 years, years ago, maybe more than 10 years ago, just with a handful of investigators in the States. And now it spans a number of countries, including South Africa, tens of thousands of, of study participants, and is really uh, kind of now referred to as one of the most um, ambitious and well-powered biological psychiatric experiments in history. Looking more locally, we have the H3 Africa, or the Human Heredity and Health in Africa Initiative. I'll talk about this a bit more at, uh, at, the, at the end of the session, but this is essentially um, kind of a similar model to the PGC in which pan-African studies are pooled. OK, 
So the kind of next section I wanted to mention a bit about was post-traumatic stress disorder as a clinical um, kind of case study for building a case for heritability. So post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. <clears throat> so I think all of us here know that South Africa is and has been a highly traumatized country. Referring again to that large representative study I talked about, the SAS, South African Stress and Health Study, it was reported that almost 75% of South Africans have experienced any traumatic event in their lifetimes. And this spans things like physical violence, experiencing an accident, death of a loved one, and then witnessing a potentially traumatic event. Even more alarming was that within this particular study cohort, the prevalence of multiple traumatic events in the lifetime was also rife. So if we look here, approximately 17, 18% of respondents had experienced two traumatic events in their lifetimes, and actually almost 10% had experienced six or more traumatic events in their lifetimes. And just to note, you know, for these kinds of research purposes, there is a distinction between an, a kind of a subjectively stress, stressful life event, things like kind of financial difficulty, and then an objectively traumatic event, things like, like witnessing uh, the death of a loved one, uh, sexual assault, and so forth. <clears throat> so PTSD, um, are you familiar with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, DSM? Does it ring any? Any bells? Okay, some, some, some nods. Okay, so, so the DSM is essentially the currently uh, one of the gold standards for psychiatric diagnoses. Uh, the DSM-4 was the prior iteration, and we've recently transitioned over to the DSM-5 as of about 2013, 2014. Um, a bit of a busy slide, but essentially what I wanted to point out was that clinically, PTSD is diagnosed after, in the first instance, exposure to a particular stressor, and this can happen, this kind of exposure can happen in a range of ways. Direct exposure, witnessing, kind of repeated indirect exposure, things like that. And then in addition to this particular index trauma or index stress stressor, you then need to have um, symptoms from four key clusters. So the first cluster, cluster B, is intrusive symptoms, things like nightmares or flashbacks. Cluster C, is a persistent avoidance behavior of any stimuli that remind you of the trauma. Cluster C, D, excuse me, is what is termed negative cognitions or mood. These are things like um, kind of a constricted mood, constricted range of mood. And finally, alterations in arousal or reactivity. Um, normally, this manifests as kind of being very irritable, being very on edge or hypervigilant, being very aggressive. So basically, patients who, who present with this, with this picture and usually have symptoms for more than a month are diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Again, looking at our, at our trusty SAS, uh, South African Stress and Health Study, what it was found that the prevalence of PTSD across all groups was 2.3%. So that's 2.3, not 23%. And this was actually really interesting at the time because there seemed to be a real discrepancy between the huge prevalence and the, and the, and the huge kind of burden of trauma exposure in South Africa and the relatively low prevalence of developing PTSD. So you can see, if, for example, you compare something like agoraphobia without panic that's up sitting at 9.8%, at and any anxiety disorder is sitting at, at almost 16%. So this was also like one of the key motivators that um, stimulated this kind of renewed energy and renewed focus on the epidemiology and on the underlying etiology or cause of PTSD. <coughs> okay. So now going through each level of our kind of hierarchy of um, heritability or gene studies, early studies of post-traumatic stress disorder were family studies. And this was a, and Rachel Yehuda is a, an American investigator who did a lot of work on offspring of Holocaust survivors. And what she found here as evidence in the far left panel she looked at offspring of three groups. So the first group in, the, in the, the white column were parents who had no exposure, so had no exposure to the Holocaust. The second group were parents who had exposure to the Holocaust but did not develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And the third group in the black column, the black bar, were parents who had exposure to the Holocaust and developed PTSD. And what you can see, I think just from eyeballing, fairly compelling evidence that the offspring of the um, parents who had both Holocaust and PTSD ex ex exposure, exposure excuse me, were significantly more at risk of developing PTSD themselves than the offspring of either of the other groups 
So it was kind of this, this, this kind of design and these kind of findings that were really prevalent in early family studies of PTSD. The next tier of our triangle are the twin studies. So these were the kind of studies that, 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 that were conducted in PTSD. You would take a large sample, about 4,000, of male twin pairs who had been in the Vietnam War. And what this particular study found was that the, the heritability, so remember the, the, the proportion of variance due to, to, to genetics was about 30 percent, which, which is approximately the, the estimation that, that withstands to, to today. And importantly, what these authors also found was a higher concordance among monozygotic, so identical, than dizygotic, or non-identical twins. So again, just kind of building this case, there seems to be a significant heritability, and there seems to be a, a, a genetic influence at play. The next tier are our candidate gene, or our SNP studies. <coughs> So I included here for anyone who is interested and wants to do maybe a, a little bit of extra reading. This is Karisten Koonin. She's based at Harvard, and she's one of the kind of foremost international experts on psychiatric epidemiology, specifically PTSD and trauma. And about 11, 12 years ago, she published this paper outlining the genetics of PTSD, where, what had happened, and potentially where, where we were going to. Now, if I was giving this, this talk maybe five years ago, I would have spent most of it looking at this slide. So this slide basically summarizes that the candidate genes, so the single variant studies in PTSD, followed the neurobiology of the disorder. So focused on the hypo, uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, uh, axis, focused on noradrenergic or norepinephrine, and then focused on the limbic frontal system, things like serotonin and dopamine. And just hundreds of single gene studies focused on genes in any one of these systems was conducted. Now, I'm not going to focus on that now, because actually, 12 years after this paper was published, the direction has moved. And where we are now, or where we have been until about five years ago, is genome-wide association studies. So this paper was published about three years ago. And you can, I, just want to, I included it to, to show you sample size and show, and, show, and show you findings. So in terms of sample size, fairly small, about 100, 150 um, military veterans and about 2,000 civilians in a replication sample. And in, this, and in this particular study, only one SNP, so only one variant, was found to be significantly associated with PTSD. So this was three years ago, four years ago, 2019. Okay, but now really, by pooling data, by adopting this consortium or team approach, we've managed to publish something which is far more well-powered than that 2015 study. So this is, I'd mentioned the PGC, this is the PTSD component of the PGC. And here you can see, so remember we had 100 and then 2,000, now we've got 20,000. So this is the largest genome-wide association study of PTSD published to date, came out 2017, 2018, looked at 20,000 participants. And it found something quite interesting. So it found a strong overlapping genetic risk between PTSD and schizophrenia. And then the second point I wanted to point out is that actually it found no genome-wide significance. So has anyone seen, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't have, but has anyone seen this kind of graph before, this kind of image? Sure. Uh, which part? Sure, so this is exactly, I'm, I'm just about to dive into this. Um, so this is what we call a Manhattan plot. Can, can, you, can you all deduce why it would be called the Manhattan plot? Because that took me about a year to figure out why it was called the Manhattan plot. So it obviously mimics the skyline of, of Manhattan. And this is basically the, 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 the standard, the gold standard figure that you'll see after genome-wide association study. So on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, your axis, you have all the chromosomes apart from the sex chromosomes, so 22 chromosomes. Where's my pointer gone? There we go. And on the y-axis, quite a quite kind of a complex statistical conversion. You have the negative log of the p-value, which is essentially a conversion of the significance value. And importantly, on the oh, where's my oopsies? Sorry about that. The slide is a little bit. There we go. On the the red dashed line represents the point of genome-wide significance. So this is essentially the point at which if, if an association between a particular variant and the disorder of interest falls above this line, then it will have genome-wide significance. So it will be statistically significantly associated with the disorder of interest. Uh, for those eagle-eyed among us, and I'm actually not that eagle-eyed, you will see that actually none of the points in this particular Manhattan plot fall above this red line. There's one on chromosome, 
uh, 13, which is creeping up there. But if you were to look closely at this plot, you would see that it doesn't actually exceed. Um, oh, and what I should also point out is that each dot represents a SNP. So each dot represent, represents a single nucleotide polymorphism, polymorphism or variant. So this particular study showed that none of the variants or none of the SNPs under investigation was found to be significantly associated with PTSD. But all was not lost. So this paper was published in a very reputable journal uh, for a few reasons. But I think what, one of the key reasons was that it included very important multi-ethnic reference data. And I included there about 10,000 African-American samples, which, as I'll discuss in the, in the, in the latter section of, of today's session, is fairly cutting edge and fairly kind of unheard of in, in genomics research. Did I answer your question? Okay. Okay, so. Mm. Sure. So, so, the, so the, the overlap and the and the plot are kind of two separate things. So the, the overlap was basically looking at it's it's quite a kind of a complex statistical modeling, but they were basically looking at whether kind of whether um, variants or whether changes in the genome that were associated with PTSD risk, whether those were also evident associated with schizophrenia risk. And they did find. So they found that, for example, if you were more at risk for PTSD, you were probably going to be more at risk for schizophrenia too. So it's kind of overlapping risk. So that was that element. This element is basically just, they basically are just looking for whether there's genetic risk, specific identifiable genetic risk for identifying, for, for developing PTSD following trauma exposure. And this kind of graph, this particular graph with none of the dots going above this particular line tells you that in this study, no significant genetic risk was found. Better? Oh, getting, getting better. <laughs> Uh, so they, yeah, so they looked at, yeah, no, no, absolutely. So they used a microarray approach. They weren't looking at all possible SNPs. They were looking at uh, probably about 500,000 SNPs on this particular, it's called a psych chip. So none of the SNPs included on this particular chip were found to be associated. So yeah, I suppose that that's definitely a more kind of technically correct way to say it. Any other questions or comments? It's a, it's a little bit of statistical modeling, um, a little bit of kind of like genomic inference and, and things like that. But for me, this, this kind of plot is always very nice because you can quite easily eyeball, you know, what, what, what is found in a study. In, in this particular study, in this... In, in, this, in this particular study, in this 20,000 person. But for, for reasons that I'm about to go into now, there are limitations to this particular study. But in this fairly well-powered, 20,000 strong study, including 10,000 African Americans, none of these SNPs investigated were found to be a significant risk. Yeah. I am, so, I, so this, this is what the kind of third section of, of the talk is going to be. So there's basically, there's a, there's a renewed appreciation of the complexity of individuals with any kind of African ancestry and how important these individuals are to be included in genomic studies and um, how, how little they have been included to date. Okay, more, more, more to be discussed shortly. There we go, an African perspective. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so what, since kind of the early noughties, we know, we acknowledge, the field is aware of the fact that there's been this bias in genomic studies, in that populations with any kind of African ancestry have been globally underrepresented. So if we compare, uh, for example, 2009, the pie, to 2016, so the black uh, wedge represents a European ancestry, the blue wedge represents any kind of European ancestry. You can see kind of a glaring underrepresentation, about 4% about non-European in 2009 to about 19% in 2016. If we zone in more closely on this blue wedge, on this kind of non-European ancestry wedge, 
we can see that kind of about 0.5% comprised Af uh, populations of African ancestry in uh, 2009, uh, increasing somewhat, but not majorly, to about 4% in 2016. So these are the kind of numbers that, that, that we're looking at. If we look at the studies that were published by that consortium I'd mentioned, the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, you can see again, uh, so on the left, we have the orange represents individuals of European ancestry, and the blue represents East Asian. So here you can see kind of very, very glaringly, most of the studies by the PGC were on populations of European ancestry. Whereas if you compare this to what the kind of global picture looks like, that orange slice is, is, is disproportionately small globally versus what has been done. And if we compare, she wanted to point out where kind of populations of African ancestry, so those who originated on the African continent, uh, it's a fairly significant slice there and not at all represented on this slide. Okay, so I, I should probably preface this, I'm not from an anthropological background, so if anyone else is, you're, you're more than welcome to weigh in. But my understanding is that it's hypothesized slash accepted slash understood that there have been ma major migration patterns, both within and from Africa to the rest of the world in the last few hundreds of thousands of years. Now, kind of transplanting this, this anthropology to a more genomic aspect, um, what this has resulted in is loss of genetic diversity. So there's something called the founding effect and bottlenecking. Has anyone ever heard of, is anyone familiar with this term? Okay, okay. I won't call on anyone because <laughs> it's fairly late in the, in the afternoon. But essentially, you know, when, when you go from a large root population or a large population of origin, when a subset of that population migrates and starts a new kind of um, descendant population from a, smaller, um, from, from a smaller number of people in, in the origin, then you are just naturally going to have loss of genetic diversity. And this is our current thinking of what's happened, why populations of African ancestry are more diverse genomically than kind of more founder or descendant populations. Now, because we've observed this, um, these populations are extremely valuable in terms of genomic research. And this is where something that I've mentioned, the H3 Africa or Human Heredity and Health in Africa initiative mm -hmm. comes in. This is funded by American funders and UK funders, and all the research happens on the African continent. Uh, very briefly, this initiative is trying both to increase research in Africa in genomics and also to build capacity and skills development of kind of early career researchers in, in Africa, including South Africa. And it spans kind of research projects, uh, uh, doing the analyses, creating a biobank, and, 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 and data sharing. So really following the model that the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium had set up. Oh, and training and mentoring, sorry, that was a very important point that I almost omitted. Uh, in the last few minutes, I just wanted to touch briefly on, on a, few, a few other initiatives that are really um, kind of committed to improved representation of African genomes in global research. So this is something called the NeuroGAP project. It's an, kind of an amalgamation of neuropsychiatric genetics in African populations. It's funded by the Harvard MIT Broad Institute in Boston. And it's basically looking to address all these issues that, that I've mentioned, improve infrastructure in Africa and South Africa, um, and translate the findings to more large-scale psychiatric genetic studies. Uh, to increase the understanding of the biology and genetics of particularly African ancestral populations, and to enhance capacity to develop skills to train and mentor early career folks in Africa who are kind of involved in and engaged in this kind of work. Just to give you kind of a brief idea of, 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 where, of where we're hoping to be in terms of, of sample size. So there are four participating countries, Ethiopia, South Africa, Kenya, and Uganda. And if you look down at the x-axis, we're trying to reach to kind of in the tens of thousands of samples, which in and of itself will make this, as far as I know, the most ambitious uh, psychiatric genomics undertaking in Africa to date. So it's a very exciting, it, we, we, we started out of what, one or two years ago, it's a very exciting undertaking, and um, it should really unfold over the next few years. Okay, so in closing, uh, definitely we are still in our infancy about psychiatric genetics, but we have really evolved from our more basic methodological family twin studies to genome-wide association studies to sequencing and beyond. That being said, we definitely still need more research. We need larger sample sizes, which is where the team science or the pooling of data comes in. We need to start being able to replicate our findings because obviously kind of once-off findings lack the strength of, of replicated findings. 
And I think what, what a lot of people in the field are now really wanting to do is look at the underlying networks, look at the underlying pathways that may explain why these gene variants are popping up. The importance of gene and, genes and environment, I will never emphasize this more. Uh, psychiatric disorders are absolutely the result of a combination of, of, of multiple factors, including genes and environment. And finally, I just, you know, the, the, the few slides that I mentioned at the end, diverse representation in genomic studies is really going to be important, not just for science, but also for kind of translation and for, and, and for, and for equity. Okay, so with that, I'll close. I'll just like to say thanks to Sharifa in her absence, to uh, Prof. Raj Ramasa, who I believe gave you your first talk, um, to Dan Stein, who is my uh, HOD, and to our uh, Brain Behavior Unit Neuroscience Institute, uh, PsychGen Group, and of course to the Center for Extramural Studies at UCT for hosting and inviting me. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have some time for questions, comments. So kind of gene, gene, gene manipulation and gene therapy. I think that at the time of the Human Genome Project, uh, that was definitely kind of a, you know, a, 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 a very kind of um, aspirational idea. I think now, 20, 30 years later, um, that is looking less aspirational. I think the main reason, specifically for psychiatric disorders, is that it's, genes are only a part of the pie. Genes are only a, so I think, I think because we, we, we don't yet know the full etiology and the full cause of psych disorders, we're definitely not at the point of gene manipulation for them yet. Definitely not. Maybe, maybe in future. Um, I think more what would be a goal would be personalized medicine. So kind of being able to target treatments based on based on, on on genetic risk i think that's that's kind of more what i've heard but i think i just need to emphasize that we we are not quite there yet second the crispr uh, we, so CRISPR hasn't played in that much to psychiatric dis for, 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 for psychiatric disorders in particular, and I think, you see, I think in, in like kind of the world of genomes, psych is a little bit unique uh, because uh, the, the, the genetic in interplay is a little bit more complex and we don't really have any, any psych genes yet. So while CRISPR may hold promise for kind of the more, the more biomedical disorders, we haven't yet seen anything really compelling between CRISPR and psychiatric disorders. For PTSD. My answer is probably going to be a bit less satisfying than you would want. So my area of interest is, is PTSD, and because it was a little bit of a late, a late uh, replacement for me, that that was my focus. Schizophrenia is probably the most, pro not most productive, but furthest along of the PGC groups. So whereas the PGC PTSD has published this one 20,000 large study, schizophrenia has published about three iterations of that. And now it's up much higher than 20,000. And I wish I'd actually brought the slide because that Manhattan plot I'd showed you, where no dots went above that dashed line. The most recent schizophrenia study, we've got, I mean, just c countless number of dots are above there. So definitely the uh, schizophrenia is probably the most developed and most researched psychiatric disorder in terms of genomics so far. And it was chosen, as you very astutely pointed, it was initially chosen maybe 20 years ago um, because of the high heritability versus something like PTSD, which is 22 to 30 percent. So absolutely on point. Now, one other of course. You, you, you're making the point here, you're in Africa. Mm. 
Sure, 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 sure. Thank, thank you very much for that. So I think there's kind of two important points to highlight here. First of all, for, for kind of more Mendelian disorders like sickle cell anemia, you would more focus on single ancestral populations. For psychiatric disorders, we, we are not in a, in a single gene Mendelian space. So I think that's kind of point number one. Point number two is definitely ancestral differences is an important confounder in analyses. And to get around that, what we usually do is do something called a... Um, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm debating, okay, I'm, I'm not going to go too far down this particular rabbit hole, but it's something called the principal component analysis. And it's basically in your statistical model, you correct or you adjust or control for ancestral variation. So it's, it's, and I think it's probably one of the most important. Now you will not, no one in, in good faith or in good reason will do a genetic study without adjusting for ancestral variation. Sure. Mm. Is it possible to um, enable the statistics or the, the analyses so that if you had a stricter definition of DPSD, you might actually find statistical significance? Yeah, I think it's something that no one should be doing. No one should be massaging uh, re results. Oh, um, what, so I'll, I'll kind of maybe speak from my experience. What we've done is we now are incorporating DSM-5 phenotypic characterization in our study. Um, I think the issue would come where you've got um, studies in which there's the potential to include DSM-4 and DSM-5 um, definitions. And I think most researchers would opt not to do that. So either exclude participants who've been diagnosed with DSM-5, go back and kind of re-administer those who have DSM-4. Because I do think, I mean, I, I do agree that having two differing like diagnostic categories is hugely problematic. They always say, I mean, when, when I was an undergrad, they always say kind of rubbish in, rubbish out. And I think that really points to the importance of your, your, your phenotype or your kind of your, your, your psychiatric diagnosis before you start doing all the kind of complex statistical modeling. So I think that that would be, would probably be what, 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 what most people would do. Try and harmonize, so try and kind of make the, the, the definition consistent in their particular study group. Mm. Uh, Kunen, K O E N E N. E N E N. Yeah. K O E N E N. Kunen. In America, they'll say Conan, I think. Any other questions? Anything or you want to say anything or more? Absolutely, yeah. I think that that's so. While schizophrenia is so highly heritable, PTSD is really interesting and unique because you require a, a, a trauma, you require an environmental stimuli before you can manifest. So you can't have PTSD without having the initial trauma. And I think that's why it's really interesting in terms of looking at genes and environment. Yeah. 
but I'm going to preamble by saying I'm not a pediatrician and I'm not an autism spe uh, a specialist. The, the, vac the, the kind of vaccine evidence that you're referring to, as far as I know, it was a study that was a debunked. So, and unfortunately, those initial study findings are something that a lot of people um, kind of very ardently believed. So the, the link between the vaccine and autism development is kind of widely refuted now.